Well, thank you for coming to this uh, 12th uh, KFRITZ Awards Ceremony. And my name is Jim Robinson, and I'm the director of the George Washington University Center for Excellence in Public Leadership. And it's our privilege to partner with the uh, KFRITZ Foundation, as well as the DC Department of Human Resources, uh, to, to bring forth the KFRITZ Awards program. And uh, we're, we're, it's, it's an exciting endeavor. Uh, we have the privilege of reading the backgrounds and bios uh, this year of more than 185 nominees. And from those 185 nominees, we have 20 finalists. We had 20 finalists. And from those 20 finalists, we have five winners. And um, so, yeah, congratulate them. And I uh, want to give special acknowledgement uh, to uh, family and friends and co-workers, and we have many um, uh, supervisors, agency directors, fire chiefs, uh, many people whose schedules are very busy but who took time out to come here to recognize uh, their employees who have either uh, been selected as finalists or in some cases selected as winners. So we want to thank you all for coming. Let's give a hand to yourselves as well as to others. The, um, one other thing I'll say also is that uh, you see me up here, but believe me, this award would not, ceremony would not have happened without some very special people. And uh, I want to acknowledge them right now before we forget and, and move too deeply into the um, occasion. Uh, first of all, uh, from the DC Department of Human Resources, I'd like to recognize Cheryl Robertson, Alex McRae, and also uh, from the mayor's office, Alex Simbano, who worked so hard to get the mayor here this evening, juggling his schedule. You can imagine what that was like. So let's give them a hand, please. Uh, there was also uh, Gloria McGee and Beth Lee. And uh, from my staff, I'd like to recognize our, our director of the KFRITZ Awards program, Kate Pitibratova, who's standing in the back, who just did a phenomenal job. Uh, Sarah Crano, as well, uh, Jing Tian, and Dr. Natalie Hopi Haddon, who are standing in the back. As you all know, without a great staff, there is very little that any director is going to be able to get done. So uh, big kudos and much appreciation to them. Um, at this time, uh, if he's ready, I think uh, good. I would like to introduce, and as I said, I am so grateful that he was able to fit us into his schedule, uh, Mayor Vincent uh, C. Gray. And I'm just going to read a little bit of his bio. Uh, on January 2nd, 2011, Vincent Gray was sworn in as the sixth elected mayor of the District of Columbia. He was overwhelmingly elected on November 2nd, 2010, garnering nearly 75% of the vote. During his campaign, he pledged to help unite the district by focusing on job creation and economic development a collaborative approach to school reform, safer streets in all neighborhoods, and restoring fiscal responsibility to city government. The Gray administration is moving forward in accomplishing the mayor's four top priorities, ensuring a quality public education for all district children, creating jobs and providing economic development opportunities for district residents, making sure residents are and feel safe no matter what neighborhood uh, they may live in, and ensuring that the city is fiscally sound. Mayor Gray is a native Washingtonian and has tirelessly advocated for the residents of the district for more than 30 years. His dedication to children and their families has been the hallmark of his service in both city government and the nonprofit sector. His lifetime of public service to the district can best be summed up by a singular governing philosophy, 
that the District of Columbia works best as one city. I'm sure you've all heard that many times. And uh, uh, he backs up his words with consistent action. A few more things. As chairman uh, of the council, Gray was a leader in efforts to improve the council's operations, transparency, and oversight capacity, and was a true champion for school reform. He spearheaded the Pre-K Expansion and Enhancement Act, which established a voluntary, high-quality preschool program to provide 2,000 new classroom slots for three- and four-year-olds over six years. The mayor's diligence resulted in that goal being met in September of 2010, well before the 2014 target. Mayor Gray has lived in the Hillcrest neighborhood of Ward 7 for more than 25 years. His wife, Loretta, an outstanding educator in the D.C. public schools, passed away from cancer in 1998. He has two children, Janice Gray Tucker and Vincent Carlos Gray, and two grandchildren. Please welcome Mayor Vincent Gray. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jim. I'm delighted to be here to be a part of <clears throat> such an important celebratory moment. Um, I appreciate the uh, wonderful introduction. In fact, I think the introduction will probably be longer than my comments, uh, which probably will be appreciated uh, as well. I do want to thank uh, Jim Robinson for the great work that he has done uh, at this outstanding university. As I listened to the background read about me, the one thing that was left out is that I attended one of the most outstanding universities in, in, in the universe. Uh, the univer I, I went to undergraduate and graduate school at this university, and of course that university is the George Washington University. <laughs> I want to recognize too that we have our, uh, our FMES uh, chief here, I know he's somewhere here, uh, Chief uh, Ellaby, there he is, Chief Ellaby, glad to have you here. You have uh, two, two of uh, the awardees, are people who work with you uh, every day, and I know you're mighty proud uh, of that fact. Also, uh, Sean Stokes, who is the director of our Department of Human uh, Resources and does a fantastic uh, job leading that department. Sean, I want to thank you very much for what you do every day also. And don't we all have to thank Calvin Kafritz? Uh, because if it weren't for the, Cal the, Cal the Kafritz Foundation, uh, their vision, uh, his commitment, um, this uh, celebratory moment, this moment of recognition simply would not uh, exist. So Calvin, I want to thank you for what you do for this city in so many ways. Um, also, I saw a good friend out here. I have to recognize her. She's the... Uh, I don't, I don't know if she's the founding director, but she should be the founding director of the Latin American uh, Youth Center. Uh, Lori Kaplan, who I think nominated one of our folks uh, here tonight. Lori, where are you? There you are. <laughs> you know, the, the uh, nominees tonight are very uh, accomplished uh, people, and it's just wonderful. You're going to hear a lot about their accomplishments, I'm sure, uh, tonight. But when you look at it, um, you look at, you know, Lieutenant uh, Sean Egan, who helped to revolutionize the fire hydrant system uh, here in the District of Columbia. What an extraordinary accomplishment. And imagine if our fire hydrant system didn't work effectively uh, in this city, uh, what kind of tragedies may, uh, you know, befall us. Uh, also, Ingrid Gutierrez, uh, who has worked so effectively in our Office of Latino Affairs uh, with our director, Roxana uh, Olivas, um, and has done such a great job, especially uh, helping to uh, promote the uh, Love of Reading uh, program uh, in Ward 5. You know, Cynthia Jones, uh, who has done so much work on our abandoned auto program in the District of Columbia, and Michael Carfin, uh, who has done so much work in helping to promote understanding of HIV uh, and AIDS in the city, getting the message right and helping people understand that their risky behaviors uh, can lead them to be in extraordinary uh, difficulty. And then uh, Deputy Fire Chief um, Vlasopoulos, 
And if I got that one right, I should get a Capers Award. <laughs> did, I, did, I, did I get it right? Better pull, out a, pull out a sixth award, Calvin. <laughs> and yeah, honorary doctor, there you go. Uh, in any event, uh, again, what an extraordinary accomplishment. He was there and during 9-1-1, uh, fighting the fire that occurred in the Pentagon and helping to uh, take what could have been an, an even worse tragedy uh, and turn it into a situation where we could have, we could have lost more lives uh, and we didn't. In any event, I first of all, Jim, want to present to you a uh, proclamation uh, for in recognizing uh, this program and recognizing the Center for Public Excellence commitment to Thank making you. sure that working with the Kayfords Foundation is continued. I'm not going to read every one of these whereases because folks probably don't want to hear every one of these whereases. But um, I, the mayor of the District of Columbia, want to commend uh, each one of the awardees uh, for their outstanding work as District of Columbia government employees, recognizing that five people have been selected for this award tonight out of about 33, 34,000 people who work for the District of Columbia government. What an extraordinary accomplishment it is uh, for them. And if I, might take, if I might take one more uh, second, one more minute, I guess, um, I also, on behalf of the Office of the Mayor, want to present each one of the awardees with a congratulatory uh, letter. And uh, if you will permit me to read one, and then, we'll permit, then we will present uh, the others to uh, the awardees. As Mayor of the District of Columbia, it's my pleasure to extend congratulations to, and the awardee's name, as a K. Fritz, uh, 2013 K. Fritz Awards, reci Awards recipient. The uh, Morris and Gwendolyn K. Fritz Foundation Awards for Distinguished DC Government Employees is presented to those individuals for their outstanding performance and exemplary service as public servants in the District of Columbia government. I would like to take this opportunity <clears throat> to commend each of you for your contributions to the community, your professionalism, and your exceptional work ethic. As you share the special occasion uh, with family and friends, um, please know that we appreciate your continued service to our beloved uh, community. On behalf of all the residents of the District of Columbia, uh, you have my best wishes for continued success. And let me just say that for those who don't know, public service jobs really are hard. They are really hard work. And frankly, they are uniquely thankless. Um, what you often hear about public service employees, which I think is absolutely fallacious, is how they do no work, and how whatever work they do is wrong, and how we ought to find replacements for every one of them. Well, let me tell you, as someone who uh, works in public service and had the opportunity once before to work in public service and work for the Council of the District of Columbia as well, there could be nothing more wrong, more erroneous than the characterization of our public employees as people who just don't get it done. They get it done. They get it done fantastically well in the District of Columbia. And frankly, we are the better for it. The five who are being awarded tonight are symbols of an outstanding workforce who make this city a great place to live in every day. Thank you all very much for what you do. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Gray. Thank you very much. Our next um, welcoming remarks uh, is uh, uh, Stephen Lerman and um, Stephen is our provost and executive vice, 
President for Academic Affairs here at the George Washington University. Uh, he became provost of the George Washington University in July of 2012. Uh, since he arrived at GW, Dr. Lerman has overseen a number of major initiatives. These include the reorganization of the university's three schools that formerly constituted the medical center, de detailed planning for a science and engineering hall scheduled to open in 2015, and expanded research opportunities for undergraduates. Dr. Lerman, together with President Knapp, has forged a partnership with the Textile Museum, leading to the upcoming construction of a new museum on the university's Foggy Bottom campus. In addition, he has worked to create a stronger identity for the university's Mount Vernon campus, where he and his wife reside. The university recently opened a state-of-the-art academic building on this campus, which houses the university writing program and a portion of the honors program, which has been expanded since he became provost. A firm advocate of global education, Dr. Lerman has worked alongside GW School of Business to establish partnerships with two institutions of higher education in China. Dr. Lerman currently is leading development of a strategic plan that will guide the university over the next decade. Dr. Lerman joined the George Washington University from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he served as Vice Chancellor and Dean for Graduate Education. He brings to GW more than 35 years of experience as a leader and scholar. He began his academic career at MIT as a student, earning a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Civil Engineering and a PhD in Transportation System Analysis. Dr. Lerman joined the MIT faculty in 1975 as assistant professor and rose through the ranks twice, earning, twice serving as chair of the faculty. His awards and honors include the Advisor of the Year Award from the National Association of Graduate and Professional Students, the Massey Teaching Award for Best Department Teacher, and uh, the Class of 1922 Distinguished Professorship at MIT. At GW, Dr. Lerman holds the A. James Clark Chair in Civil and Environmental Engineering. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Lerman. Well, thank you uh, for the long introduction, but I appreciate it. Uh, so it is my pleasure to welcome you all here. Uh, this is the 12th annual Morris and Gwendolyn K. Fritz Foundation Awards, and of course, it is for honoring distinguished DC government employees. Uh, before I actually sort of open the remarks, I just want to give some special thanks. First, of course, to the Morris and Gwendolyn K. Fritz Foundation, who are, of course, the sponsors of the awards and of this event. Uh, Mr. Calvin Kafritz, who's the president and CEO of the foundation, and has been so since 1993, and who will actually present the winners with their awards. Uh, and I'd like to thank the GW Center for Excellence in Public Leadership for organizing this evening. So again, thank you to all those groups. Uh, one of the great characteristics of this university, exemplified, of course, by our, one of our most illustrious alumni, the mayor, uh, is its commitment to public service. And, and the mayor alluded earlier to perhaps a growing cynicism about public service, and I think he was unambiguous about how misplaced that was. The truth is, uh, cynicism or not, we in this country expect uh, our fires to be fought, our streets to be safe, our vehicles to be inspected. When emergencies and disasters arise, we expect our public servants to rise to that occasion and help us. When we are in individual need, our servants, public servants provide help. Uh, we educate our students and do so many things. And the truth is, we've taken it for granted. But here, today, we get the opportunity to honor a small number of the large number of people who have devoted their lives to serving the public. And as Mayor said, it is often a thankless job, but it's a job that we absolutely need. It's done extraordinarily well. It's often done quietly and in an unsung way, but it is a set of functions that we as Americans have come to rely upon. The quality of our public servants is in no small measure part of our greatness. And it's just a wonderful thing to be able to honor these people here 
But of course, in doing so, we should always remember, these are just a small number of the enormous number of public servants here in the District of Columbia, and maybe more importantly, throughout the country, who have dedicated their lives to serving others. And it's an extraordinarily important calling. It's something we should have a deep respect for. And for those of you in the audience who have done this uh, for your careers, thank you. And we greatly appreciate it. Here at the university, we've tried to instill that respect and desire for public service in many ways. Uh, one of the things that is a theme in the new strategic plan, which just was approved by our trustees just uh, a week ago, in fact, or two weeks ago, uh, is the notion that every one of our students should be imbued with an understanding of what we're calling citizenship and leadership. And we don't mean citizenship, of course, in that you know, where, where your passport is from. We mean citizenship in terms of understanding both your obligations and your rights as a citizen at multiple levels. One of the important ways our graduates exercise that citizenship and leadership is often through public service. Uh, our students are disproportionately interested in that, in my experience. They care deeply about public service. They care deeply about how they as individuals can contribute to the common good. Many of them choose public service careers, and even those who don't often choose careers in what I would call the helping industries, the nonprofits, the service sector, uh, people who provide health services. This is very much in the DNA of a university I have come to uh, and one that I am extraordinarily proud of. So hosting this event just feels so right for us. It's something that you know, we ought to do more of. It's a pleasure. This is actually the third one of these I've been able to be, to be at, and it's an honor and privilege to be here. So welcome. This is a partnership that I hope endures. Uh, it is our honor and privilege to be a citizen as a university of the District of Columbia and to be part of a, a great city whose public servants have made it a, a wonderful place to live, to learn, to teach, uh, to be a student, and to be a citizen. So thank you very much for being here, and this is a great event. Thank you, Dr. Lerman. Uh, let's take a, before we, we move forward, let's just take a second to give you a little bit of background, um, again, about the awards and the awards program. Uh, the Morris and Gwendolyn Kayfritz Foundation, as you know, sponsors these awards and it was really a decision by Mr. Calvin Kayfritz that too often we hear the negative and so often our excellent public servants go unnoticed. In fact, if they do their jobs well, nobody notices. Uh, and so uh, the thought was that why don't we recognize the excellence uh, that we see all around us in district government and let's do it publicly. And uh, so uh, Mr. Kayfritz decided to found the awards program, and this is the, the 12th year for the awards program. Just a little bit about the process. So this year we had um, 185 nominees. Uh, we partner closely with the DC Department of Human Resources to uh, publicize the program, to encourage uh, not only other public servants, but also community residents to nominate people that they feel are deserving of the Kayfritz Award. Uh, the HR organization works diligently. We put out, uh, they put out emails and notifications and we put posters all around. They do a great job of getting the word out and encouraging uh, directors and uh, community citizens to nominate uh, folks for the award. After we receive the nominations, we then communicate with those people who have been nominated to let them know that they've been nominated and to assist them in putting together a portfolio documenting their, the reasons for their nomination, the reasons why they should be considered for the Kayfords Awards. And that's quite a uh, thick package of materials that they put together, including their own letters, letters of recommendation, uh, from a variety of people, their resumes, background data, quite a document that is put together. 
Uh, we then review the portfolios for every nominee who has submitted them. And we then go through a grueling process of uh, whittling that down to 20 or so finalists. This year it was 20. We then take those uh, 20 finalists, we, nom we, we let them know that they are finalists, and we then take their portfolios and they're sent to a selection committee. The selection committee reach, reads uh, each of the 20 portfolios. And we allow several weeks, perhaps a month, for them to read each portfolio in detail. We then have a selection committee meeting, at which point we attempt to reach consensus on five winners. That, that meeting takes several hours, believe me. And, uh, but we, we talk it through. We make the case for each of the people that we think should be among the five. Uh, and after two or three hours, uh, we usually will arrive at a consensus. Uh, and so that's the, the, the process we go through. So the Kayford's Award process actually begins tonight. Uh, we have forms outside for you to begin the nominating process for the 2014 Kayford's Award. So next year's awards process actually starts tonight. And we'll be accepting uh, nominations uh, into the fall. So this is a year-long process that culminates in this evening's ceremony. The other thing that I'd like you to know um, is that each of the winners receives a $7,500 cash prize, and uh, in addition to their recognition here, along as with a Tiffany uh, plate. Each of the um, finalists uh, will receive a, a certificate uh, as well this evening. I want to also go over the selection criteria, what we look at when we review these uh, documents. Number one, we ask, have they solved an extraordinary problem or achieved a significantly difficult goal? Two, have they performed an outstanding act which brought positive recognition to the city? Have they successfully initiated and implemented an innovative idea that brought about dramatic results? Have they consistently achieved excellence in overall job performance that is well above and beyond the call of duty? And finally, have they demonstrated outstanding and inspirational leadership that dramatically improved employee morale and team spirit? And what's remarkable about uh, many of our um, finalists, and particularly our winners, is that many of them have demonstrated excellence in probably three, four, even all five categories and criteria. Just truly, truly outstanding achievement. So what I would like to do is to introduce our finalists. And when I call the name of the finalists, I would like that person to please stand up. And please, let's recognize that person uh, when they stand. And we're going to start with Antonio Atkins. <laughs> Antonio Atkins is a police officer with the Metropolitan Police Department. Next is Gerard Brown. And Gerard is a program manager with the Bureau of Community Hygiene in the Department of Health. Next is Mary E. Chambers. <laughs> Mary is a support enforcement specialist. And if anybody's nervous here, you know who you are. Uh, Child Support Services Division, <laughs> Office of the Attorney General. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Next is Cleveland H. Dent. <laughs> Cleveland is a site manager for the Department of Parks and Recreation. 
Next is Cynthia Locke Henderson. She is a clinical school social worker, social services with DC Public Schools. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, Stella Hodge uh, is not here this evening, but she is a chief problem resolution, uh, chief of the problem resolution office in the Office of Tax and Revenue. That's some job, believe me. Congratulations, Stella. Next is Alberta Jova, and he is a police lieutenant with the Metropolitan Police Department, and he's not here this evening, but let's give him a round of applause. Stephen Lyons. He is the Deputy General Counsel for the Office of the Chief Financial Officer. Thank you. Uh, Carl Matthews is not here this evening, but Carl is a heavy mobile equipment repair person in his Department of the Youth Rehabilitation Services. I might add, I'm, I'm very aware of this, that his title is about one-fifth of what he actually does. Um, next is Darlene Nolan. And Darlene is a customer and information services specialist with a DC office on aging. Thank you. Next is Sandra Phillips Gilbert. And she is a social service representative with the Economic Security Administration in the Department of Human Services. Thank you. And next is Laverne D. Plater. She is a nurse consultant in the Office of Chief Nursing Executive and the Department of Mental Health. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Peter Benedict Segedi Masak. He is chairman of the D.C. Rental Housing Commission, Department of Housing and Community Development. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Next is Azelik Tegeni. Not here, but recognize him. And Lucas Zarwell. He is the Chief Toxicologist, Department of Toxicology, Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Let's give each one of those in the total group a round of applause again. I can truly say it was my pleasure to, to read their portfolios and to review all the outstanding accomplishments and, and achievements. Uh, not just one time either, we're talking about over a period of years. And one of the things that stands out uh, about our finalists and winners is persistence and a never say die, never give up attitude uh, that enables them to move mountains. Uh, and so, uh, that's a, an unusual quality that we're, we're very pleased to um, honor here tonight. All right. Um, what we want to do now is move to the winners. And as soon as I find their descriptions, we'll do that. Let me hold on one second.
what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to introduce the winners to you and uh, one at a time and then we're going to show a video clip uh, that gives some details of their accomplishments and, and the kinds of things that people appreciate them for. Uh, first, I want to introduce Sean Murray Egan. He's with DC Fire and EMS Services. My name is Lieutenant Sean Egan with the DC Fire and EMS Department. Sean leads by example, and if Sean puts his mind to it, he's going to do it. Uh, he's that committed and dedicated to the community. He saw the plight and the need of children who did not have the ability to enjoy the holidays with a, with a gift of any kind. There was more people that actually needed assistance through Toys for Tots during Christmas time. So what we did was we contacted the United States Marine Corps, uh, this is shortly after 9-11, and we asked to partner with them. And the Marines thought it was a great idea that the fire department partner with them, especially now that we were at wartime. And many of the Marines that were available to assist with Toys for Tots were now deployed in the Middle East. We didn't realize, uh, but what we were doing was setting ourselves up for probably one of the largest humanitarian programs that happens during a non-emergency situation. The impact of Toys for Tots has been tremendous. One is because every year we can be guaranteed for Toys for Tots through Lieutenant Egan that there's going to be toys there for the children. So where I started out at collecting 2,500 toys on an annual basis, we took it to well over 80,000 toys. There's been several occasions where the Marine Corps will stop the, the cutoff for the Toys for Tots Sean would find other avenues for them to be used within the community here in Washington, D.C. One of the recipients uh, that we were able to supply toys to was Children's uh, Hospital. They also had a toy drive uh, during the Christmas period, um, but they were challenged on receiving the toys. We partnered them with the United States Marines. We averaged about 25,000 toys that were actually going to Children's Hospital. That allowed them to open up Santa's room where the mother and the father could actually go in and pick a toy that would be appropriate not only for the child that was in the hospital, but there may have been another child or two children that were at home, but the parents didn't have time to go out and get what was needed for Christmas. And, and the beautiful thing is not only the, the, the power of the numbers of toys, but also the power of having him there. And these are families that are having a hard time putting food on the table. They're having a hard time paying the rent. What we found with that was, is that the following year after the child was discharged, is that the families were coming back and donating to Children's Hospital. So the contributions actually came back tenfold. Sean has put a lot of time into it, a time and energy uh, without um, wanting recognition because it was the right thing to do. The fire hydrants throughout the city were under a deferred maintenance program, and many of them uh, were broken. They were out of date. Uh, there was 24 different makes and models. He had contacts at the Water and Sewer Authority. We had a need as an agency to really have dynamic fire hydrant information, how much water the fire hydrants put out, how, where they're located, uh, whether they're available for us to use or broken. We were able to change gears with uh, the Water Authority. Uh, they invested uh, about $35 million uh, for the first five years and then additional funding would follow each their year thereafter uh, to upgrade all of the fire hydrants within the District of Columbia. It was at that time we were able to change the fire hydrant specifications. So if we had a large enough incident or we had multiple incidents where we asked our neighboring partners within the region to respond in, they now can hook up to our fire hydrants. Uh, we've now uh, mapped out all of the fire hydrants, which would before were just on cardstock. Now we have electronic information. And now they're able to know through GPS where every fire hydrant is. And that is a tremendous amount of information that we've never had before. 
So the community service units, uh, it was uh, an expansion that uh, came about in uh, 2008. And the CSU program really was a success. We had firefighters going out and working with the Water and Sewer Authority to check nine plus thousand hydrants. And, and, it, and it was more than that. It was defining where we had problem areas because the water system wasn't supplying enough water to certain areas of the city. They would provide briefs out there on scene to develop a water supply strategy to show them where to bring the water from the area that was not impacted into the impacted area. And we worked together to enhance our what we call our response plan to those areas. We deployed them during large storms, major storms, uh, snowmageddon. It expanded the agency's capability uh, tenfold. You could say that's a, a mechanism to be organized and all that, but on, on the level of you and I, it's really saving lives. You get there on a fire and the fire hydrant doesn't work and you don't know that it doesn't work, you're wasting precious moments, precious seconds that could actually end someone's life. Sean is someone who doesn't seek recognition. Many of the accomplishments that uh, I've been able to do over the years has not been without assistance. I've had great support from the administration. Um, I've had tremendous support and buy-in from the troops, our firefighters and EMTs that are out here on the street every day. He should be the epitome of what many district government workers should strive to be. He works 24-7. I know firemen work 24-7, but he works beyond the 24-7 um, to make sure that, that his community is uh, not just safe from a fire, but safe on a daily basis um, to make sure that they live a much more prosperous and a much more enjoyable life. Look at the output that Sean has done and given back to the city in a way it's improved the quality of life not only for the residents, but the visitors, and also for the firefighters that he serves. I know that many of the things that I've started and begun will be carried on after I retire. So, um, and I feel good about that because even when I decide to leave, that uh, my next step in life will still be continuing to work with other community outreach groups, uh, other fire departments and many of the things that I've been able to do and that I believe will carry on long after I'm gone. Please welcome Sean Egan. Mr. Mayor, distinguished guests, Mr. Kayfritz, the Kayfritz Foundation, honorees, we're all winners tonight. We stand shoulder to shoulder. The District of Columbia is a better place because of what we do. I'd like to speci uh, specifically uh, thank the Kayfritz Foundation and the family for what they have done to be able to recognize the distinguished work of the government employees of the District of Columbia. And that is tremendous, and I personally want to thank each and every one of them. Thank you, sir. I want to thank the uh, fire chief for coming out, many of the ex executive staff members, uh, and my family for coming out tonight. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Our next winner 
is Ingrid Gutierrez, Community Outreach Coordinator, Office on Latino Affairs, and the Executive Office of the Mayor. Ingrid has dedicated her life to educating and empowering the district's Latino population through countless community service projects and initiatives such as the For Love of Reading program in Ward 5, among many others. Please welcome Ingrid. Uh, well, I'll tell you, we're going to see the video first for Ingrid Gutierrez, and then we'll welcome her to the stage. Mi nombre es Ingrid Gutierrez. My name is Ingrid Gutierrez. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Mayor's Office on Latino Affairs. Ingrid's job is not just a job, it's, it's a mission. She is the bridge between many of the government agencies and the Latino community. We are growing seeds in the District of Columbia. And for me, it is very important that these seeds grow roots by uh, having uh, education, higher education. Ingrid sees the need for the Latino community not to enclose themselves. That you, they, yes, there are Latino, they speak the same language, and maybe they don't speak English, but they should try to learn English, that they should learn English so that they can integrate with the other communities in the district. I have worked with um, several schools, but especially with the Powell Elementary School, uh, we created this book club cafe. Uh, we call them Floor for the Love of Reading. In Espanol, Por el Amor a la Lectura. She coordinates a group of, of parents. They meet usually once a week so that they read. And the reading is, has multiple uh, impacts. One is that she's reaching out to parents who come from countries that have been war torn and they haven't had good educational systems. She's from Guatemala, she understands that. So by holding these reading uh, groups, she's addressing literacy skills in the parents. So by you being exposed to this program, you then feel, wow, I need to learn how to read and write because I don't want to be sitting in Ingrid's program just being quiet and passive. Through these reading groups that she's coordinated here at Powell, at Bruce Monroe, and other sites, she creates a comfort space for the parents to come together. And so it's great to see Ingrid bringing in Filipinos, bringing in African Americans, and other, other culture, other communities into their groups so that they can, they have this safe space where they can learn from each other and help each other. I got involved uh, uh, for the Love of Reading Floor uh, about three years ago when Ms. Gutierrez introduced it here at Powell. And after that, I have gained a lot of Spanish friends. You know, most of my friends are Spanish parents. And, and it brought us like close together as a community because of that. These individuals, if it wasn't for these programs, will be going to their particular zip codes. These individuals are interdependent upon each other. We come from a migratory experience. We're struggling with English. With English, We're struggling with our challenges with respect to understanding the school system. But as a whole, as a collective, we can survive. Working with her on the grants uh, investment side, she had a great initiative of having a five-day or a either one concentrated one week training or multiple Saturday trainings for parents and the purpose was how do we get parents to be leaders in their schools and they can replicate these parent engagement programs. We worked with Teaching for Change who had the expertise coming up with curriculums and coordinating these kinds of trainings and we held one at our office and we brought in 20 parents from various schools and the goal was to train them to be the trainers, train them to be English around around the cities. By Ingrid interacting with the parents, that community is then in a better position to understand, advocate, and also present their point of view so that point of view can be integrated in the policies of the educational system here in Washington, D.C. There are various activities or initiatives that she takes on as part of her work that are impressive and speak to who she is. We coordinate public, uh, public safety initiatives uh, that means going out to the community and raising awareness on 
crime prevention or reporting crime. Because of their immigration status, people do not um, uh, report crime uh, to MPD. So we work in campaigns such as Call 911 or If You See Something, Say Something campaign. We participated in the Ask Your Doctor about the test, uh, which was an HIV testing campaign. Um, and I, my family and I were part of the campaign, so uh, the posters were on the buses, the metro station. The first thing people thought that I was sick, uh, that I have HIV, and I say, no, this is for you to take the test. You need to be tested. Like I say, it's a high rate of HIV uh, spread within the Latino community, and we need the prevention. And what better way to promote an initiative where they can relate to me I got the test done, you know, you can get the test done. One of the latest projects that she's working on now is a entrepreneurship program for women. So women that are working out of their homes. If cleaning homes is what you're good at and you want to do that and that's a good way for you to bring income into your home, she wants to help them put the business in place. What do you need to do to, to have the legal basis to operate and what are things that you should know about? the business, um, whether that's safety standards, licensing, whatever it might be. But importantly, how do you develop yourself to become an entrepreneur? The program that Ingrid is instilling creates self-esteem, creates leadership, especially among women. Because as we know, Central and South America there is a lot of machismo and the role of the male sometimes, no, frequently, supersedes the role of males. So here it is, creating a forum for women to feel empowered. And she's able to relate to many of those business owners uh, uh, because she sees herself and many of them. Many of them are come here as immigrants as, as her and her husband came here as immigrants. And came here with just the clothes on their backs, with nothing. And they've established their families here, they've grown a business here, they've raised their kids here. She's an individual that is loved, I'm talking about love, by many, many, many folk. And we feel in a way that we also are part of that award. Ingrid embodies uh, a lot of the struggle of the Latino community and the potential of where we can be and where we can go. Please welcome Ingrid Gutierrez. Ingrid, please come up. Ingrid, please come to stage. Good evening, uh, Mayor Gray. I think he left us already. Uh, fellow award recipients, their colleagues, friends, and family, and everyone from the Morris and Gwendolyn K. Fritz Foundation, the George Washington University, and the DC Human Resources. My name is Ingrid Gutierrez, and I am the Community Outreach Specialist at the Mayor's Office on Latino Affairs, uh, where I have been working for over five years. To begin, I would like to thank the Morris and Gwendolyn K. Fritz Foundation for recognizing the commitment and valuable work of the public servants here in the District of Columbia. And for generously giving me the opportunity to be one of the recipients of this honorable award. Uh, I would like to thank Mayor Vincent Gray for your leadership of, one, of our one city and uh, your advocacy for the Latino population here in the district. This opportunity would not have been possible without the continued support of my fellow colleagues at the Office on Latino Affairs. Uh, would you please stand up?
especially Director Roxana Olivas and Deputy Director Didier Sinistera. Would you please stand up? <laughs> Thank you for trusting my knowledge and experience to carry out the mission of the Office on Latino Affairs. I will also like to extend a special thank you to my family and friends who have served as my mentors, collaborators, and inspiration. My dear husband, Eric, and my wonderful kids, Eric, uh, David, and Cynthia, <laughs> who you saw on the, on the video with the HIV campaign. Um, to my dear friends who are always there to help out, uh, you know who you are, and certainly I will not be standing here today without you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I am humbled and honored to have been selected for the award for Distinguished District of Columbia Employee. Receiving this award was incredibly exciting knowing that someone was watching and appreciating the impact that our community outreach program at the Office of Latino Affairs is making on the lives of many Latino individuals in the District of Columbia. I would like to thank uh, the person who nominated me, and as of now, I, uh, it was anonymous, but I think uh, Ms. Lori Kaplan, who is my mentor and a dear friend who um, has guided me uh, throughout my career. Thank you, Lori. Through my career, I have worked on issues that directly affect the Latino population, including voter registration, influenza vaccination drives, and HIV test campaigns, in which I had the pleasure to work with a fellow KFRIS Award recipient, Michael Carpen. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Being an immigrant and a parent myself helps me understand the needs and the challenges of our Latino community, which grants me creative insight when implementing initiatives and information campaigns, or simply, <laughs> Uh, reach out to our constituents in the District of Columbia. I am incredibly grateful towards Principal Docal and staff members at Powell Elementary School for opening the doors and allowing me to begin innovating new programs at their school. This includes floors, the one you saw in the video, for the love of reading, a new program I created at Powell Elementary to encourage parents to maintain more open communication with their children through the tools of storytelling and reading. It is very gratifying knowing that the par parents at Powell Elementary School have continued meeting on a regular basis and participating in school activities and seeing the tangible impacts of my work. Not only are parents becoming more involved in the lives of their children, but the moms and dads at these schools have come together as a group of advocates to work alongside school staff in improving education for their children. Thank you all again. I could not have reached this accomplishment today without all of your support and the opportunity to serve the residents of the diverse city through working at the Mayor's Office on Latino Affairs. I am blessed to work in an environment where we not only continue to improve the quality of life of Latinos in the district, but making lasting impact of their lives in what I strive every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ingrid. Our next winner is Cynthia L. Jones. She's a program manager, the Abandoned Vehicle Operations Department of Public Works. Cynthia L. Jones spearheaded the effort to pass the Abandoned Auto Reform Act and launched DC's first online auctioning system for the disposal of abandoned vehicles. Ms. Ms. Jones also happens to be a graduate of GW Sepals program for excellence in municipal management. So a graduate of one of our programs, esteemed graduate. I believe that at the time that she initiated the project, there were over 10,000 abandoned vehicles. If you know about abandoned vehicles, that, that leads to blight. It leads to the deterioration of a neighborhood. Um, if any of you have abandoned vehicles, don't go back and look for them because Cynthia already has them. <laughs> <laughs> so.
So let's take a look at the video for Cynthia Jones. I'm Cynthia Jones. I am the program manager with the Abandoned Vehicle Division within the DC Department of Public Works. The Abandoned Vehicle Division is responsible for the removal and disposal of abandoned and dangerous vehicles throughout the District of Columbia. Back in the year 2001, that was when the district's um, 311 system came into play, where residents were able to call in request services from district agencies. At that time, there was a backlog of over 10,000 requests for the removal of abandoned vehicles. These were vehicles that were uh, badly damaged, perhaps uh, had been uh, torched, uh, jagged metal, uh, broken glass, missing tires. We had some areas where abandoned vehicles were used to store drugs. So uh, that created crisis in communities. At that time, I was tapped to improve the removal and response time to requests for the removal of these vehicles. It was taking us three to four weeks to remove them, and she helped us uh, design a method where we were getting to those vehicles in three to four days. The computer system they were using was antiquated. The district was losing cars, per se, because there was no real tracking system for vehicles when they were towed and when they were disposed of. So we decided that we need to get an automated tracking system for vehicles when they're towed. So in 2005, we instituted the new lot management system, which tracks vehicles from the time they're towed from the street to the time they're towed to a lot. The other thing is that once we got the cars, uh, they were stored up in our impoundment lot and she helped us figure out um, reducing the amount of time so that we would auction them off and get them out of the impoundment lot. So get them off the street faster, get them out of the impoundment lot faster. Without collaboration with other agencies within the district government, that we were not going to be successful. What good is it to remove the vehicles if when you remove the vehicle, the trash is still there, the rats are still there. And so Cynthia working with her agency, uh, DCRA Housing and MPD, uh, we would just go over with these blitz and with cranes and, and, and trucks and just clean up the neighborhoods. She was more or less a central part of the core team and led several groups and, and get things done without calls having to come in to the 311 center. Occasionally we had to go back, but the initial impact made the uh, citizens or that street or that block or that neighborhood feel like they had control of their lives. On another level, she is also deeply committed to public service through customer service. There is no one I know who is a fan of parking enforcement when it's their vehicle that has been towed and impounded. She is uh, the, the visionary behind the new customer service center at our Blue Plains impoundment lot. Prior to the new customer service center, anyone who came to the Blue Plains impoundment lot probably didn't realize that we could not accept payments there. So they would then have to go back to uh, another DC government office, make the payment, and then come back to the impoundment lot in order to retrieve their vehicle. Cynthia came up with the idea of uh, allowing them to pay online without having to go to DMV. And so that's really uh, put a, a, a nice customer focus uh, point of view on how D a DPW services our clients. Over a decade ago, they used to spend many days, weeks preparing vehicles to be auctioned. And it took up a lot of time, took up a lot of resources. And the online process now, she has worked from A to Z to make that process so much easier for the customers. You have to look at the safety of your customers. Then you have to look at, okay, how can we actually really track money that the district is receiving when we dispose of these vehicles? 
abandoned vehicles are more quickly sold. Uh, the value is a lot higher. With the district, on an average, we have generated over $1.5 million each year since using the online auction system. So she improved the auction process and then helped us do, uh, work on the legislation to keep the cars for a shorter period of time. She is an expert in the law, the regulations that govern how abandoned and junk vehicles are to be handled. Cynthia helped us pass the Abandoned Auto Reform Act uh, by uh, explaining to the lawyers exactly what was happening on the ground and uh, what needed to be done as far as uh, the amount of time that a vehicle needed to be in the impoundment lot, what the challenges were, and then working with the lawyers and sort of crafting what legislation that the city council needed to pass. This resulted in our ability to remove vehicles from private and public roadways in a more expeditious manner. Anyone can tell someone what to do. What I look for in a leader is who gets people to follow them, willingly to follow them. And she, her relationship with her staff is just great. And they trust that whatever she's telling them to do, it's the right thing to do. Cynthia um, started out uh, in the district government, I guess you as a teenager. She came in through the summer youth program and then came in through working in the neighborhoods program and has worked her way up through the ranks. She uh, has been a, a person that has pulled herself up by her bootstraps. And it's good to see that the district recognizes someone that came from the ranks. She is a force of nature. And she is the kind of person that you want to have on your team. She is a leader. She is able to bring people together, to work together, and to accomplish what needs to be done. And I think Cynthia exemplifies that customer focus, customer service type of person that uh, anyone would choose DPW, they would choose Cynthia. Please welcome Cynthia Jones. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am not going to keep you long. I'd like to first of all to give thanks to my higher power, to my family, to my friends, to all of my colleagues that have worked with me who are sitting in this audience. I'd like to thank my director, Mr. Howland. There he is there. My deputy director, Mr. Mike Carter and my co-workers who are here as well. You know, I have to go along with what Mayor Gray said about public service. I started public service by watching my mom. She was the neighborhood mother. She took care of everyone. At this time, I have to thank the K. Fritz Foundation I am still processing this. I am so excited. I have to thank Mr. Robinson. Oh my goodness. When I came through the George Washington University program, he said, Cynthia, don't ever change. I was like, should I tone it down a little bit? He said, no, don't ever change. <laughs> so I'm still the same. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you. Those of you that nominated me, those of you that wrote the letters of recommendation, for me, and thank you so much, Kate and Jason. Thank you all. Oh.
<laughs> Our next winner is Michael Carfen. And Michael is the Bureau Chief of Partnerships, Capacity Building, and Community Outreach with the Department of Health. Michael revolutionized the district's public health messaging on the HIV AIDS epidemic, making our city a national model for service delivery in HIV testing, prevention, and treatment. Let's look at the video for Michael Carfin. My name is Michael Carfin, and I have two titles. Um, I am the Bureau Chief for Partnerships, Capacity Building, and Community Outreach, and I'm the Interim Bureau Chief for STD and TB Control. What you may have seen over the city, a bunch of posters or billboards or bus signs dealing with some aspect or another of HIV AIDS and prevention and response and getting treatment. These were all developed in order to respond to a, an acute need we saw of people not utilizing a lot of the services and the tools that were available to prevent HIV in this city at this time. Where we started was trying to get condoms available to people. We went from 500,000 condoms in 2007 to over five and a half million condoms last year. Now we're also trying to change the conversation and try to get away from the stigma associated with condoms. And this has been particularly about how I approach work in our social marketing. So whether it's been our Ask for the Test campaign around HIV testing, our Join the Rubber Revolution, um, or our Female Condom, DC's Doing It campaign, it's that we don't make it look like a public health campaign. He has often reminded us that whenever you're talking about HIV, you're talking about sex. Uh, and sometimes people can become a little uncomfortable. You know, even as a contractor, uh, he likes to tease me that I, I blush often when it's time to have the discussion about sex. But I mean, that's just a fact of life as it relates to HIV um, and other STD prevention. He helped to really transform how public health messages are conveyed to the public and the community. And his public health messages were edgy and conveyed the messages that people needed to hear, not your traditional government public health messages. The campaign won the Public Relations Society of America Bronze Anvil Award of Commendation, which is the leading award uh, in our industry. We knew we didn't just need a good campaign here or a good campaign there, but we needed a whole strategy. And so Michael, he saw the five-year vision from the beginning, and that's how Michael helped both conceptualize but then drive the formal development of, as boring as it sounds, a contract and a partnership that would allow us to roll out a five to six year series of social marketing campaigns. We still have a lot of progress to make, but over the five years, we have really uh, seen uh, increased understanding around HIV prevention. And as a result, millions of condoms have been distributed all across the city. Thousands of people have been able to access um, medication for HIV treatment and youth have access to prevention programs that otherwise weren't either known or available. We also created a whole new program for young people called RAPMC, W-R-A-P-M-C, which stands for Master of Condoms, by the way, um, because we, the Department of Health, actually certify people as a condom educator. I don't, we couldn't find any other program in the country that does this. Now we have these RAP MCs in every one of our public high schools, and this year we're expanding this to now have young people be able to distribute condoms and educate their peers in school. And we provided screening to over 5,000 young people and education to over about 8,000 of them. Our, um, director of the Department of Health credited our condom program and our efforts around reaching young people um, to help uh, as, a, as contributing to that reduction of both teen pregnancy rates. We were able to start a school-based screening program where we go into the high schools and provide education and testing for um, adolescents in 26 public and charter high schools. There was some resistance around it. It was an out-of-the-box type program and he really um, was able to provide direct leadership 
um, as well as passion and commitment to make sure that it got off the ground in a very collaborative style to involve other governmental agencies, community partners, and of course youth. He recognized that adolescents aren't just shorter adults or younger adults, that they're their own population and have their own needs um, and really need their own strategies. They helped to develop any social marketing materials, helped to develop the messages, the presentations, and really helped shape the program. And I think that was really key to its success. More young people are getting screened. Um, they're becoming more aware of the fact that there are STDs out there uh, and that we're providing them this, this information. So we're one of only three cities in the country that does this. And when we go around, um, when other jurisdictions find out about this, they're like, how can we do this? So under Michael's leadership, the number of community-based organizations that participated each year increased. And the Effie Berry program was originally developed to be able to help particularly small faith-based and community-based organizations in Ward 7 and 8, so some of our underserved wards in the city, to engage more effectively, more efficiently in the HIV response. And this program got sustained over time, but also there was the building of an identity. Essentially, I think, became a point of pride to step up and say, hey, I'm an Effie Berry organization. And I think this, this project brings out a lot of the things that Michael really does well um, in terms of bringing a lot of players to the table, making things open and communicated and actively engaging participants uh, and also saying, okay, we might be starting at one level, but how do we make it better? He's not here because it's a job and it's a paycheck. He's here because he really believes that he can make a difference in the city. There's a lot of people here and in the community who have known for a long time that he's this kind of quiet, quiet warrior who's um, really fighting for the residents and the visitors in the district. Um, and he's just tenacious. He just keeps going and doesn't stop. When you work together in a spirit of collaboration with the right leader in place, as Michael has been, uh, you can do amazing things. Michael is the best you can get for bringing solutions and innovation and creativity and impact into the government system. Young people who are looking at, like, why go into government? Why would you do this kind of work? Can you really make a difference? I think he embodies not only, yes, you can make a difference, but how much of a distinctive difference you can make in terms of recognizing an individual who embodies these best qualities that we would like to see in our, our government employees that we turn to. He's it. He's got it all across the board. Michael Carfin. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like very much to thank the K. Fritz Foundation, Mr. K. Fritz. Thank you for your commitment to D.C. government employees, uh, to, uh, George, to the George Washington University. <laughs> uh, we're partners in many of our programs around HIV, so I've gotten used to knowing that it's the George Washington University. And, and the center, and particularly to the staff there, Kate and uh, Jason and his great to make us look so like, wow. Um, uh, I'm, I'm truly humbled by this because to me this is really, uh, my m mission is really about collaboration and working with others to make a difference. Um, I'm really grateful to have a tremendous staff and colleagues at the Department of Health. Um, because it's truly a team effort. You can't do all this by yourself. And uh, they have the same passion and commitment to helping people. Um, my mother tells me a told me a story that when I was a little kid, she asked me, uh, where do you want to live when you grow up? 
and I said, Washington, D.C. And she was kind of surprised by that, and she said, why do you want to live in Washington, D.C.? I said, well, I want to be president. Um, <laughs> that didn't quite happen, um, but I got the privilege to uh, live and work in D.C. and work for the people of the District of Columbia and work with the, the many people in district government. I know the, we've heard before about uh, government employees and public service workers sometimes not getting the recognition they deserve. And I think the finalists, the nominees, the winners here tonight have really exemplified what, what we all believe in, and that is about helping people. And um, so for that, I'm, I'm extremely, extremely humbled by all of this, and uh, thank you again very much. Our next winner is Demetrius Lasopoulos, Deputy Fire Chief, Operations Division, District of Columbia Fire and DMS Department. Mr. Lasopoulos was, at, was there on the roof of the Pentagon putting out fires the night after 9-11's terrorist attack. His other major initiative involved integrating Google Earth Globe into the department's mobile data computers, which increased public safety and brought national recognition for the district. Let's look at the video uh, for him and then we'll invite him to the stage. During my tenure as a Deputy Fire Chief, Chief Information Officer with the Washington DC Fire and EMS Department, uh, I really was in-depthly involved with an initiative that to put mobile data computing technology in all the fire apparatus, all the police cars, the EMS units. This mobile data computer allowed uh, critical information, including past medical history, so that in route to the call, our providers would see that information and begin to formulate what they were going to do to provide care. And I would describe what he did for the District of Columbia Fire Department as going from worst to first as it relates to information technology. Technology is amazing, uh, but but it, it, it has a greater requirement to find somebody who understands how to harness that technology in a way that's useful to, to a uh, community. And uh, Chief Lasopoulos uh, really had a rare combination of the public safety cluster, the fire and EMS service, and he also had that same understanding uh, with technology. Chief uh, Lasopoulos uh, has brought forth new types of innovation um, something that only now other government agencies are looking to do. Most people know what Google Earth is. It's a free downloadable application that most people have on their computer. DC purchased their own Google Earth Globe and rolled the public safety data layers into it securely. See, with technology, usually um, you got to find ways for the rubber to meet the road. And what happens is that Chief V works with operations and support and so we had to find ways to tie in 911 calls, fire hydrant flow data, um, police lo vehicle locations, fire vehicle locations. I remember one day uh, we had a bad thunderstorm come through the district. It was in the summertime and it knocked trees down and power in the northeast quadrants of the city near Providence Hospital. We used the Google Earth Globe to bring up critical infrastructure and public health facilities in that area. We were proactive saying, hi, this is the fire and EMS department. Do you have power after the storm? If not, how can we help you? Uh, we've de deployed it in cities, counties, states uh, throughout the U.S., but I think by far Chief V's idea and approach to all of this has led um, um, other agencies to, to actually adopt similar types of uh, technology. So we worked on the mobile data terminal project. Um, and basically that incorporates GPS on the fire apparatus, a computer with a map uh, in, the, in the trucks, um, and it ties back to the communication center. So when events are sent to that system, 
the firefighters see it, it can route them to the event. Um, the benefit of GPS is that it will select the closest units to respond to the event. In Snowmageddon in 2010, when the city suffered back-to-back -back storms, our ability to be able to watch streets that were being plowed, to be able to redirect ambulances and fire trucks into areas so they wouldn't get stuck by snow, that, was, that, that had never been done before anywhere. As the liaison to the Office of Unified Communications, we did some incredible things. We built systems that allowed us to really effectively communicate with the region. There was a catastrophic two-way radio system failure in the district where all police and fire lost their ability to communicate via radios for about six hours. This outage was catastrophic, but we had a plan and within 20 minutes we were covered. We were getting all of our calls on the mobile data computers. We were able to communicate on a different uh, radio system, Montgomery counties. The resource that I had with Chief Asopoulos was an excellent fire officer that could do practically anything that I asked, coupled with the fact he was a great information and technology officer. There's more than 11,000 fire hydrants in the District of Columbia, and that's the backbone when it comes to fire suppression in any community. We had found ours uh, woefully in need of repair, woefully out of date, and other related problems. The impact of implementing the fire hydrant tracking program at Chief Asopoulos' level was for us to be able to have an idea of what fire hydrants were working and which ones were not. This kind of stuff is live information across multiple private public uh, areas. It also shows the location of every fire hydrant, fire truck, an EMS unit in the city all in real time. And through the application of tracking that information by computer, Chief Asopoulos moved us ahead. Once again, I'm going to describe from perhaps one of the worst communities in America to one of the very best. The way he pushes to, to innovate and evolve uh, the solutions in, within government, it's typically very difficult to create those areas of collaboration. I can think of very few people who, who invested so much time, personal time, professional time, uh, to improve the public safety of Washington, D.C. For me, Jim has always been a strong leader. Um, for me, a mentor as well. I always think of him always stepping into roles where you know, other people may shy away because of potential political issues or um, just, just backlash. But that didn't bother him. He was first and foremost concerned about the first responders, the fire department, their safety, and getting things done right. When we were hosting a State of the Union address or an inauguration or the marathon, it was Chief Lasopoulos who was here all day, all weekend, making sure that the technology and the communications existed so that we could provide the people who live here and who work here and who visit here the, the, the most quality public safety service that can be provided. One of the most important um, milestones, things that occurred in my career. I was actually deployed to the Pentagon to finish putting the roof fires out that were still actively burning on the morning of 9-12. Being on top of the Pentagon and breaking the slate up and opening up the wood decking and exposing the fire that was still burning and then after the fire was out being on the roof and overlooking it, everything that occurred there. I'm very proud that I was able to help that day and that will never leave me my whole life. When I think of Chief Demetrius Vasopoulos, immediately I go right to excellence, to an employee that gave more than he ever needed to. I think if the city had to pay him overtime for the additional hours that he put in, it would be thousands upon thousands of dollars. And he always worked hard to make sure that the firefighters, EMS, and paramedics on the street of the city had the information that they needed at their fingertips coupled with doing an incredible job as a fire officer. Hats off to Chief Vesophilus. Demetrius Vesophilus.
Wow. That's all I have to say is wow. Um, Mr. Kaferts and the foundation, the George Washington University, Mayor Gray, you know, his words uh, do resonate with, with us as public workers, public safety workers, government workers. Gosh, he, he nailed it on that. It's unfortunately many times a thankless job. Uh, Kate and her team, her whole team, which I think just is comprised of just Jason over there. Uh, but I understand when the, when the early, when earlier on, uh, somebody announced some other people that I didn't know, but the team d did a phenomenal job, I guess continues to do a phenomenal job, and uh, thank you. I know her vacation begins tomorrow, no doubt. <laughs> Fellow award recipients and final, finalists, congratulations. Uh, my mother, Joyce, uh, where's my mom? Stand up, mom. Um, <laughs> Chris Service, Chris Service nominated me. He saw something, in, I guess, in me uh, that he believed was worthy of nomination to the Kayfords Foundation. And uh, if it wasn't for that nomination, I guess I wouldn't be standing here in front of you to, tonight. Chris, where are you? Stand up, please. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Chris is a 36. Chris is a 36-year District of Columbia uh, Fire and EMS Department government worker. 36 years and still on the job. And most importantly, thank you to my wife, Tracy, and my sons, Nicholas and Alexander. Please stand up. Thank you all very much for this acknowledgement. My father, Gregory, would have been so proud of me. He passed away about a year and a, a, year and a half ago at 75 years old. He emigrated to Philadelphia in 1955 from Greece. He was from a small island in the Ionian Sea called Ithaca, Ithaca, Ithaiki, yes, the same Ithaca as in Homer's epic, The Odyssey, and home to Odysseus. My father was a pillar in the Philadelphia American Greek community. He loved America and Greece and attained his citizenship within a few years of being in this country. He was an active member and leader of the Greek Orthodox Church, the scoutmaster of the local Boy Scout troop, of which I became an Eagle Scout of, and maintained leadership roles in many other philanthropic and community-based groups. He was a great man, and we all miss him very much. I was born in West Philadelphia on May 30th, 1963, and if you're quick with your math, you'll realize I turn 50 years old tomorrow. I was inspired to become, thank you, I was inspired to become a volunteer firefighter in the late 70s by a fellow Boy Scout who was already a volunteer firefighter. In 1979, at 16 years old, I joined my local volunteer fire company in Springfield Township, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Springfield is, Springfield is about five miles uh, southwest of Philadelphia. The camaraderie of working with other firefighters, serving our community, and of course, the excitement of fighting fires had me hooked for life. I knew I needed to become a career firefighter, and I learned of an opportunity to become a firefighter in D.C. I came down to D.C. in 1984, along with a few of my volunteer firefighter friends, and we stood for hours around Roosevelt High School, along with 2,000 other would-be firefighters. And within a couple of years, three of us were sworn in to protect the citizens, workers, and visitors of this great city. Over the years, I had the pleasure to serve all over the city. I was originally assigned to work uh, in Brightwood in Truck Company 11, which is on Georgia Avenue up by Missouri Avenue. I spent nine years there and loved every minute of serving and protecting that fine community. In 2001, I was assigned as the captain of Engine Company 18, which is up from the Marine Corps barracks on 8th Street Southeast near Pennsylvania Avenue. It was an incredible working there and serving the communities in and around Capitol Hill. On September 11, 2001, I had just finished working a 24-hour shift and drove past the Pentagon on the way home. Little did I know what would occur a couple hours later. After the Pentagon was struck and the fire and EMS department was placed on full mobilization status, all off-duty firefighters were called back to work. I kissed my wife and uh, my son, Nicholas, who at the time was two years old, goodbye, and I told him not to worry about me and I headed back down to D.C. to Engine 18's firehouse. However, Engine 18 and Ladder Truck 7, also stationed there, because of their proximity to Interstate uh, 395 in the Pentagon, were already at the Pentagon 
uh, assisting our fellow firefighters from Arlington County. All the firefighters who were off duty that day showed back up for work. They came in from all over the region, and they reported back quickly and without delay. It didn't matter where they lived, they immediately came back to serve the citizens of the District of Columbia. We took an oath, oath to serve, and even on that terrible day in our country's history, not knowing what else might happen and what could happen to them, they came back. This is what public safety professionals do, and epitomizes at a high level the extraordinary commitment of DC government workers and subsequently what the Kaferts Foundation stands for. On 9-11, 343 fellow brother New York City firefighters died. We must never forget the commitments and sacrifices made by our public safety employees. They serve and protect our citizens and are a critical component to the health and well-being of our communities. I wanted to acknowledge past chiefs Adrian Thompson, Dennis Rubin, who you saw in the video, and current chief Kenneth Ellerby. Chief Thompson promoted me to battalion chief in 2006, which provided me the opportunity to really begin making enhancements to our public safety communications, technologies, policies, and procedures. Chief Rubin for promoting me to deputy fire chief in 2008 and entrusting me to be the chief information officer. It was during his tenure that I was afforded the opportunity to work through, bu through bureaucracy and change the way our agency uh, was doing business. I was proud to have fostered a close working relationship with other DC government agencies, as well as federal government agencies, but OCTO, MPD, and the Office of Unified Communications in particular. And of course, fellow fire and EMS department co-workers. We collaborated, cooperated, and worked extremely diligently to deploy more efficient technologies. Chief Ellerby, thank you for affording me the opportunity to serve as a division commander back in operations. My, so my fire service career began in operations and will end in operations as I plan to retire uh, from the District of Columbia government on June 15th of uh, this year. Finally, and uh, most importantly, thank you to my family. Since becoming a chief officer in 2006, my family had to deal with constant interruptions from the fire department. Whether it was having to compose important emails after getting home from working 11 or 12 hour days, hushing my wife, during a conversation so I can listen to a significant incident playing out over the two-way radio, responding back after just getting home because of a significant event, or simply always being connected to work with a computer, even on vacations, right? The point is, public safety doesn't take a break. When we step up and assume positions of responsibility, we must realize the burdens that come with the positions. However, one cannot overstate the honor for serving our fellow man and communities we are charged to protect. I, couldn't, I would never change that for the world, although we must acknowledge how these sacrifices affect our families. So thank you, Tracy, Nick, and Alex for dealing with me all these years. Mom, I love you for the values you and Dad instilled in me, and I am dead, indebted uh, for life. Uh, and being recognized by the Kafers Foundation during the twilight of my career with the DC Fire and EMS Department is the best honor anyone could ever dream of. Thank you everyone who supported me and made today a reality. God bless. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, thank you all so much. Congratulations to you. Um, just the diversity of experience and expertise you bring and the contributions you've made uh, just uplifts us all this evening. So thank you so much for being who you are and the contributions that you've made. And though it's been a long evening, I thank you for your, your attention. And uh, we're just going to conclude with some congratulatory remarks. And uh, I'd like to introduce Sean Stokes. And uh, Sean is the director of the DC Department of Human Resources. And she has more than 20 years of experience in human resources and financial services. Prior to being appointed director of DC Department of Human Resources in April of 2011, Sean serves as the Chief, Chief Human Capital Officer for the Baltimore City Public School System, where she provided strategic guidance on talent acquisition and retention, performance evaluation, professional development, and compensation for highly qualified educators and support staff. 
Sean's commitment to human resources and improving organization effectiveness have led her to the District of Columbia government, where she started to review processes and enhance programs such as the district's telecommuting program. She earned a bachelor's degree in business from Delaware State University and a master's degree in engineering from Connecticut State University. She is a resident of DC's Ward 5. Please welcome Sean Stokes. Thank you, Jim, for making me sound so good. I was sitting up there saying, gosh, this is a hard act to follow. Um, I was like, gee, they make me go last. And on top of that, uh, the staff in DCHR did such a wonderful job of preparing comments for me, but that didn't work because as I was listening and hearing everyone, I was like, oh, I want to change that. I want to change this. And now I don't know exactly where to start because I can't follow my notes. <laughs> so I'm going to try to get it all in. Um, first, I, I'd like to say good evening. Good evening, okay. Um, and I would also like to recognize the finalists and the winners um, because I think today um, really in, in the, the footage and, and in your comments and just you know sitting up here, you, you don't kind of get the view that we get and just um, how proud your family, your friends um, you know, are of you. You can actually see it. So it's, it's just exciting and I'm sure they don't get to see you in this light. So I think it's, it's wonderful to see. Um, but I think there's an acknowledgement that needs to be made around the level of dedication. Um, I would say uh, your, your demonstrated leadership, uh, the level of commitment, um, the vision that each of you, and you, it's very clear in, in your, your footage, um, the vision that you had around this work, which required a level of innovation to do the work that you do. Um, and I really want to give you a round of applause for that because, you know, these moments don't come every day. And you really need to kind of soak it up, right? Don't you agree? So we're going to stand and we're going to give you a round of applause again, OK? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'd like to congratulate you formally um, for receiving and winning the 2013 KFRITS Awards, as well as the finalists. Uh, thank you for being dedicated public servants. And what's so nice about this reward is that we get to reward you for something that I know I heard each of you say that you love to do. It's innate. It's, in, it's, it's who you are. So it's, uh, I don't want to say that it's effortless. But I didn't see anyone come up here saying, oh, I don't like my job. Um, so it's, it's just, I think it, it's even more special because of that. Um, the other thing that I, I really saw is that there is a level of consistency around what you do. Um, you know, when you talk to, about the public safety, um, a good day, a bad day, you still have to deliver the service. And that requires you to be... Um, consistent and what I would say effective leaders who um, often um, because of these award you receiving this award I'm sure there's days where you have to pick people up a lot right um, and sometimes you need to be picked up but I'm sure you do a lot of the picking up and um, you know thank you for that so I also wanted to uh, thank uh, Kate um, Kate where are you you here still oh she's in the back okay Kate thank you um, for all of your efforts and uh, working with our staff, uh, Cheryl Robertson, I think she's in the room somewhere. She may have left. Oh, there she is. Okay, Cheryl. Um, just the continued partnership as well as uh, Jim Robertson from uh, the George Washington University, um, who we meet regularly and, and really think about creative ways to continue to, to um, publicize the program because it is a great program to recognize our, our employees. Um, and then a special thanks also to the um, the Morris and Gwendolyn Kafritz Foundation for sponsoring the program and for your tireless commitment uh, to improving the quality uh, of, uh, of life for residents in the District of Columbia. So I just wanted to say those few, few words. I don't think I missed anything, but um, again, just thank you and thank you for joining us this evening and we'll see you same time next year, right? Okay. <laughs> Uh, 
I believe, uh, Kate, do we have a video? Congratulatory remarks from uh, the president of the George Washington University. We'll be brief. Uh, I'm not going to read his bio, but I, I found something very interesting in uh, President Stephen Knapp's bio. bio. He's a specialist in romanticism. <laughs> not sure exactly what all that means, but it sounds intriguing. Um, let's see the uh, congratulatory remarks from um, Dr. Stephen Knapp. Good evening, and welcome to the 12th annual Morris and Gwendolyn Kaferts Foundation Awards for Distinguished DC Government Employees. I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight to tell the finalists, as well as the winners, in person, how much we appreciate your service to Washington, D.C. The George Washington University is committed to being not only in, but also of Washington, and the partnership between GW's Center for Excellence in Public Leadership and the Kaferts Foundation to honor the service of district government employees is an important symbol of that commitment. The Kaferts Awards recognize outstanding performance and exemplary service by DC government employees. Tonight, we give special thanks to five extraordinary individuals for their contributions to the promotion of such ideals as public service, leadership, and innovation. On behalf of the university, I'd like to thank all district employees for the enthusiasm and dedication you bring to your work and for your commitment to improving the quality of life for all of us who live or work in this great capital city. Once again, congratulations to the finalists and to the winners of this year's Kaferts Awards. Thank you. And finally, I would like to introduce, uh, really, uh, Mr. Calvin Kaferts, and uh, just give a little bit about his background. And uh, he's the eldest son. He's the president and CEO of the Morris and Gwendolyn Kaferts Foundation. He is the eldest son of Morris and Gwendolyn Kaferts and a native Washingtonian. He has been involved in real estate for more than 50 years. He was elected to the board of directors of the Morris and Gwendolyn Kaferts Foundation in December of 1988. And since February 1989, he has served as board chairman. In July 1993, he was elected president and CEO of the foundation. As chairman, president, and CEO, Mr. Kaferitz is directly responsible for the real estate and non-real estate portfolio of the foundation and subsidiary corporations. The foundation is the largest private, independent, local foundation that focuses solely on Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Under Mr. Kaferitz's leadership, the foundation has awarded more than $301 million to 6,614 projects. Quite substantial. <laughs> Mr. Kaferitz began his career with the Kaferitz Construction Company in 1947. After college and military service, he rejoined the firm in 1956 and served in various positions until the death of his father in 1964 when he became president of the Kaferitz Company, Kaferitz Construction Company and Ambassador Incorporated. During his tenure, the companies developed, constructed, and leased a number of additional office buildings in Washington's Central Business District. In 1971, Mr. Kaferitz resigned to form Calvin Kaferitz Enterprises with investments in aviation, communications, and Washington area real estate. Mr. Kaferts is a member of several civic and cultural organizations, including the Trustees Council of the National Gallery of Art, trustee of the Federal City Council, and director of the DC College Access Program. And I would like to just personally say that uh, to commend and thank Mr. Kaferts for his vision, for his consistent dedication to the Kaferts Awards Program, and for his continued support and enthusiasm for recognizing outstanding employees of the District of Columbia government. Please welcome Mr. Calvin Kaferts to the podium. introductions. 
I, I want to compliment you for the fine work that you've done over the years Thanks. to make this program such a great success. Um, on behalf of the board and staff of the Morris and Gwendolyn Capers Foundation, I'm delighted to congratulate all of the winners and finalists who are being recognized tonight at the 12th Annual Capers Awards Gala. I would like to acknowledge the, president, the presence of uh, Capers Foundation board members. Uh, I think um, Johnny e. Chapman was, is he here tonight? I think he was here earlier, and my lovely wife, Jane. And also, um, I'd like to recognize our executive director, Roseanne Cleveland, and members of our wonderful staff. If you would stand up for a minute. Glad, glad you could make it tonight. The mission of our foundation is to improve the lives of residents in the Washington metropolitan area. We are proud to be supporting a program that shines a light on the contributions of tonight's extraordinary individuals. These innovative and caring municipal workers make the district a welcoming destination for visitors and a vibrant community for those who live and work in the region. We thank all of the Capers Award winners for their hard work, ingenuity, and commitment to public service day in and day out. I had uh, other remarks here, but I'm going to cut it short because the evening's getting late. So I would like to say, in closing, I would like to acknowledge President Stephen Knapp, Provost Stephen Lehrman, the George Washington University for their continuing support of this program. For administering the Caperts Awards, we thank Jim Robinson and his staff, including Kate piata Bravtova. Let me also extend our appreciation to Mayor Vincent Gray, uh, Director Sean Stokes, thank you for being here tonight, and the District of Columbia Department of Human Resources for their support. We are honored to have our distinguished guests join us in saluting these outstanding DC employees. How pleased we are that all of you could join us here this evening. Again, congratulations to all of the Caferts Award recipients, the nominees, as well as their families, supervisors, and colleagues. We hope to see you here again at next year's Caperts Awards for distinguished DC government employees. Thank you very much for coming and good evening.